So we have protein digestion and absorption. And uh, so if you remember what we said last time, uh, we have a double goal when we digest proteins. And the first one is we want to denature the proteins from food. Uh, so we want to unfold them so that they can be more easily uh, broken down by our digestive enzymes. By denaturing the proteins, we will lose their functions. But again, you remember, that's not a problem because we do not care about the function when we eat proteins. We only care about the amino acids. So once we unfold these proteins, then they will be given to the enzymes, to the digestive enzymes that will start breaking them down completely into the individual amino acid. So breaking down protein all the way down to the single little building blocks, the amino acids, is the goal of protein digestion. Then those amino acids will be absorbed and used by our body to make the proteins that we need. Because uh, protein denaturation is part of protein digestion, we could say that protein digestion really starts when we cook proteins. Because remember, heat is one of the ways that we can accomplish protein denaturation. So when we cook our meat, our animal proteins, we will partially denature some of those proteins and thereby making it easier then to digest them. And also for the hard connective tissues like meat, cooking also will partially soften these tissues so that then it will be easier to digest them and break them down. In our mouth, we will chew, so we will keep, you know, mix that saliva, making it easier to then break them down. But really, uh, protein digestion starts in the stomach. And here, we have the very acidic environment of uh, the stomach. And remember, low pH is the other way that we can uh, denature proteins. And so here is the step where we will <coughs> unfold most of the proteins, if not all of them. They will be completely unfolded, and again, I'll say this one more time, they will lose their original function, uh, which is why many times when somebody tells you, you know, eat this protein from this supplement, from this food, because there is this specific enzyme that will help digestion, that will just do and that, but remember that most of these proteins will be just be broken down in the stomach, so these functions, whatever it is, will be lost before it gets into our body, unless it is a drug that is somehow coated so that it can get through the stomach and somehow be absorbed in a different way than the normal protein digestion, but normally protein will just be broken down and lose their function. And then in the stomach, we have uh, an enzyme that is a protease, Pexin, and this enzyme will start this work of protein breakdown. It is not really thorough, the job that it does. It's kind of, you have this long chain and you start randomly cut with scissors. Well, it's not random, it actually recognizes specific amino acids, but it certainly doesn't go down to individual amino acids. So you, you will have this long chain and it will be somehow broken into smaller chain of different lengths the real uh, breakdown will then happen in the small intestine. In the small intestine, we have a family of enzymes. It's a whole team of different uh, proteases. Trypsin is by far the leading enzyme. It's not the only one. It comes from the pancreas. There's actually another couple of uh, protein is coming from the pancreas that will start breaking amino acid down, recognize different amino acids and breaking them down at that specific point of the chain. We also have one a proteolytic enzyme already in the small intestine, but they will all do kind of the same thing, which is making this chain smaller and smaller at to this point to small uh, peptides, and by peptide I mean short proteins of two, three, four, five amino acids long. And now, these small peptides will then go to the brush border, the wall of our intestine, 
well, we have the absorptive cells, and here we have another last team of enzymes that will complete the breakdown to the individual amino acid. This can happen on the brush border, or we can also absorb some of these small peptides to amino acids, three amino acids long, and once they are inside the intestinal cell here, enzymes will complete the breakdown. But anyhow, what the result will be is the individual amino acids. So we have completely broken down the protein. And now these amino acids will be able to be absorbed, that is, go through the intestinal wall into the bloodstream. And so, of course, this happens at the same time. The brush border, the intestinal cells will complete protein digestion and accomplish protein absorption from the small intestine into the bloodstream. There is actually one little exception to this a general rule that we break protein down and we only absorb the amino acids and we lose the function. Um, sometimes very small proteins or pieces of proteins, fragments, can leak through the intestine um, by different ways. And this especially happens in infants uh, younger than five months. Their intestine is a little bit more permeable. So these small uh, peptides can go through uh, without being completely broken down. And this has two main consequences. Um, the first one is allergies predisposition, because when we have now a whole protein or a piece of protein into our body, into our bloodstream, then it will be recognized as something foreign. So it will likely be attacked or activate some kind of immunity response, which is then the basis for maybe developing an allergy. And, which is the reason why you generally do not give to uh, babies up until they're five, six, one years old the foods that contain the allergens or proteins that are more, more likely to then develop allergies, you know, strawberries, fish. And then the other um, consequence if, is if this protein or this fragment of protein has indeed a biological function, uh, it will keep it. And now we will have, and this happens in infants, but it, it also happens to adults to some different extents with some specific uh, proteins. Now we have inside our body a protein that has a function, but that we didn't build, we didn't make ourselves. So it will keep this function without us deciding it. And so it will have a sort of pharmacological effect. There are some um, casomorphins in milk that have some opiate-like activities so that it will calm you down, make you happier. There are some people that claim that they cannot sleep without first drinking milk. And there are some scientists that claim that the reason why this happens is because there are these little peptides that have opiate-like activity. And then chocolate has some other, eggs has some other. And this can happen in some people. This little protein fragments can then be absorbed into. But the general rule, uh, aside from these exceptions, is in protein digestion, we break protein down completely and we only take the amino acids in and we lose the function. Was that a question? No. Okay. Uh, now, we have to absorb our amino acids. So they have to go into the bloodstream. Um, amino acids are water soluble, so it's really easy. Remember all that uh, uh, trouble you had to go through with fatty acids, they are not water soluble, they are soaked, so you have to package them into the lipose. Nothing like that with amino acids, they can just go directly into the bloodstream because they are water soluble. So from the small intestine, they will take the portal vein and go to the liver. So you can see here, we have our small intestine, uh, here we have the intestinal wall with the absorptive cells. Here on the brush border we will complete protein digestion or we will take some small peptides in and break them down uh, here inside the cell. But then the individual amino acids will go into the bloodstream here, it's the portal vein, 
that will bring them to the liver. And the liver will sort them out depending on the body needs, of what the body needs to do with these amino acids that we just absorbed. It can do protein synthesis, as we saw last time, or these amino acids, they may be used for energy production if it's needed. If we do not need them for energy production, then they will be converted to either fat or glucose and stored. And we will see all these uh, different uses of proteins later on. But this is just to say it's the liver that you know, does this sort out and decides where they go. It may keep them and use it itself or send it to other organs. There are actually some amino acids that we will see next time, the branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, and valine, that kind of skip this liver step and they can go straight to the muscle that will use them for energy production. But uh, we will see this next time. Can I safely move on? Nobody will get mad. Um, so now we go a little bit more in detail uh, on protein functions. Remember, uh, the first thing we said is protein mostly have structural and regulatory functions. Structural functions, we mean proteins are key components of all of our tissues and organs in our body. So our muscle, our connective tissues, our skin, our hair, our nails, keratin in our hair is a protein, our bones, our bone matrix is made of protein. But once we use a protein to build all these structures, they, they will not then stay there forever, but they will be continuously broken down and repaired. So these proteins will be changed, will be replaced throughout all of our lives. And this is what we call the protein turnover. Tissues and organs in our body are constantly broken down and repaired. So we continuously need protein to do this maintenance activity. And the consequence is that we need structural proteins not only to grow uh, new tissues, but also to maintain them, to repair them throughout all of our lives. And this protein turnover is actually pretty big. On average for an adult, it's about 250 grams of protein every day of protein turnover. But luckily, most of these amino acids are recycled, so uh, our protein requirement from diet, as we will see, is not 250 grams. Likely, it's way less because uh, our protein need is mostly covered by recycling all of these amino acids. So our protein intake will uh, have to be lower than our protein turnover. All right, and then as for the regulatory functions, means we need protein not only to build all these structures, but also to make all these structures work. So all of our metabolic processes involve proteins to some extent. And I'm warning you, there's a lot of text coming up, but again, do not get mad. You do not need to write all this down, uh, just a few keywords. Um, it is just to um, appreciate, you know, the variety of things that protein accomplishes, uh, regulatory elements of our metabolism. All of our enzymes are proteins. Uh, here you have three examples, three digestive enzymes that you're already familiar with. Trypsin, for protein digestion, it is a protein itself. Lactase, to digest lactose. Lipase, to break down lipids. But then you do not only need enzymes for digestion, you need enzymes for all of your metabolic uh, pathways in your body. Many hormones are proteins, insulin to uh, use glucose, glucagon, thyroid hormones. Um, and then another keyword you want to write down, immunity. Our antibodies are protein, so to help us fight uh, bacteria, viruses, our antibodies, they are proteins. They are Signaling molecules, uh, neurotransmitters are many times are proteins, so carrying this signal between 
our nervous cells. Dopamine, remember last time we said, is a product of phenylalanine metabolism, epinephrine, uh, again, from the same uh, amino acid. Serotonin is made from an amino acid, which is tryptophan. Histamine, they're all from histidine, they're all uh, neurotransmitters coming or from proteins. Um, second messengers, mainly here we have molecules that carry messages inside the cell from the membrane to the nucleus or other organelles or from the nucleus to the DNA. They can be proteins. Transporters and carriers, think hemoglobin that transport oxygen in our blood, think transferrin that transports iron, or membrane proteins, so those proteins that you have in, in the membranes of all your cells that regulate what goes in and goes out of your cells, your ions, your nutrients, your hydrogen. They can be receptors, so that they will recognize signals, for example, from hormones. So you will have these proteins on the surface of your cells to recognize uh, hormones uh, coming. Storage proteins, again, some example, myoglobin to store oxygen in our cells, ferritin to store iron, seroplasmin to store a bunch of trace minerals like zinc, copper. Antioxidant defense, uh, glutathione is our most important uh, antioxidant molecule that we make ourselves. We can certainly bring antioxidant in from the diet, but we also make antioxidant ourselves. That glutathione is the most important. It's a little protein made of only three amino acids, but it's a protein. Muscle contraction, actin and myosin that allows our muscle to uh, perform their work, and so on and so on. We could go on with this list. So proteins are involved in virtually all of our metabolic processes. And I will strategically drink here. Okay, and now we focus on a couple of uh, regulatory functions of proteins that are very important and in your book. Um, fluid balance. Um, blood proteins, and the most abundant protein we have in our bloodstream is albumin, maintain fluid balance. And here's how it works. So you have your capillary here. Uh, in it, you have your blood, your red blood cells, water, all the nutrients and the electrolytes, and these proteins. Now, here uh, at the bed of the capillaries, the, the blood pressure will force fluid with all its nutrients and oxygen and ions out of the blood vessel uh, from the space between your uh, endothelium so that it will go into your extracellular space, into your interstitial space. But blood protein, like albumin, are too big to go through these sort of pores, so they will stay inside your capillary. And the reason you have this fluid outside is that it then can exchange stuff with your cells. It can exchange nutrients, it can exchange oxygen, carbon dioxide, ions. But then, at some point, it will have to go back in the blood vessel to, you know, keep going. And this is accomplished by protein. Remember, they are, they stayed inside and they create an osmotic pressure that will somehow, you know, suck fluid back in the blood vessel. But if you do not have this protein or you do not have enough, then they cannot do this, they cannot take fluid back in and so it will stay out in your extracellular space and you will have edema. And of course, you will have it first in the lower extremities because gravity doesn't help. It's like this in, in this foot. And edema has, has many causes, but one of them is just protein deficiencies. You do not have enough proteins, you will not have enough albumin, and this will happen. Another uh, reason you can easily understand is high blood pressure. You will just have higher pressure here. You will have more fluid going out and protein will not be strong enough to bring it back in. Acid-base balance. Uh, membrane proteins, you recognize here we have cell membrane. Uh, you, you see that the double layer of phospholipids, some 
cholesterol, here's the yellow, some carbohydrates, and here is your membrane protein. It's kind of a channel that regulates what goes in and out, and one of these things is, for example, hydrogen. And by deciding how much goes in and out, it will be able to uh, strictly maintain the acidity, so the pH of your blood, which is vital uh, to be in a strict range so that you can sustain life and all of your metabolism. And another way you can do this is in your blood, there are proteins that can act as buffers, which is now they are just proteins in your bloodstream that can uh, block some hydrogen if you have too much or release it if you do not have enough. And by doing this also uh, affect pH. And then of course this function of proteins, membranes, not only to regulate hydrogen, but also to regulate, you know, all other ions, so your electric, your potentials, your osmotic gradients, and, and so on. Now, proteins can also be used as an emergency source of glucose. Uh, it's not the ideal use for a protein, but some, sometimes you have to do this. Some amino acid can be converted to glucose, and you will do not all of them, but about half of amino acids can be converted to glucose, and you will do that because you want to maintain blood glucose levels stable, which you remember is very, very important. It is vital because your brain is very picky, only wants glucose, it doesn't want fat. Uh, your red blood cells also only work with glucose. So you normally will maintain blood glucose by eating, you know, carbohydrates. You have a little bit of storage, you know, you have some glycogen stores in your liver, you remember, but that's not a lot. So if you fast or go on a very, very low calorie and unbalanced diet, you will deplete at some point very quickly, actually, your glycogen stores. And then uh, you cannot make glucose from fat. So the only thing you can do is make glucose from proteins. But remember, you do not have any storage of proteins either. So you will have to go and steal these proteins from your muscle, uh, and, uh, which is the reason why then you will have muscle wasting. And which also the reason why if you want to lose weight, you certainly do not just stop eating because then this will happen. You will just start destroying muscle and lean mass to maintain blood glucose stable. And you also remember from our first slides, proteins can also be used for energy because they uh, provide four kilocalories per gram, like carbohydrates. But our body doesn't really like to use proteins for energy. It's kind of a waste because we have carbohydrates and fat for energy production. So it's just like you wouldn't uh, burn your precious wooden artifact in, in, in the fireplace. You would just use plain wood, which would be carbohydrates and fats. But of course, you know, if it's freezing cold and you're out of wood, you probably start considering using your uh, wooden uh, artifact for energy. And your body that does j just that. So if, if you don't have enough glucose and, uh, and fats, you will use uh, protein for energy which is kind of a waste because they could be used for much more important things, the structural and regulatory functions that we saw before. There are mainly three situations where we will end up using proteins for energy production. And the first one is if we go on a high protein, low carbohydrate, low fat diet, could be a weight loss diet, could be some athletes going on high protein diet, but low carb and low fat. So now you do not have enough carbs and fats for energy and you will have to use proteins. Now, this is not the worst case scenario because now you're not stealing protein from muscle, you're just eating extra protein and because you have extra, you use them for energy in place of carbs and fats. Uh, it's, uh, it's just a waste of proteins. You know, it's like if you're very rich and you say, in my fireplace, I only want to burn Chinese uh, wooden sculptures. You can do that. Uh, you won't harm anybody. It's just probably not smart. But then a way worse scenario is if you just fast or go on a very low calorie diet. Now it's 
low everything. So it's low carb, low fat, and low protein. So just plain low energy. You do not have enough. And now you start have using proteins from your muscle. So you're not burning extra. You're not burning your wooden artifact. You're starting you know, to take wood from the walls of your house. So this is much worse. Or there is a third case, which is prolonged exercise. Now, because you're exercising very fa fast, you will deplete your glycogen stores. Once you're out of glycogen, especially if you're doing an anaerobic activity, you cannot burn fat, because you cannot burn fat without oxygen. You're out of glucose, so again, you have to turn to proteins. And uh, branched uh, chain amino acids uh, that we will see next time are preferred. They kind of are more easy to uh, make energy from. They also go straight to the muscles, so they will be used for energy. And then also, if we have excess proteins and we do not need them for protein synthesis because we have enough, we do not even need them for energy because we are lazy, we're not exercising, we're just eating too much. Now, uh, we will take these proteins and make, convert them to fat. And this happens every time that you just eat more than you need. So every time you have excess energy, be it excess carbs, uh, excess lipids, or excess proteins, if you do not have any other use for it, you will just convert all of these molecules to fat and put them in your adipose tissue. And by the way, once you do that, there's no way back, which is what this red cross means. You cannot say, oh, wait a second, no, I actually needed that protein. Can we make protein back from fat? You cannot. So once it's fat, it's fat. You either burn it as such or you keep it and get fat. You know, these last three uh, uses of proteins, which is making glucose or making fat or using protein for energy, uh, it are what we call protein catabolism, because it's kind of we are using this protein. We are breaking them down for some reason. But what we really need for protein catabolism is this part of the protein, the carbon skeleton to use them for energy or to make fat or glucose. Remember, fat and carbohydrates, they do not have nitrogen. So before we can use proteins for uh, catabolism, we will have to uh, remove uh, nitrogen first. But the problem with that is that when you remove the amino group, you get ammonia. Uh, free ammonia is highly toxic for your body, so it has to be immediately processed by your liver to make urea, which is also toxic, but way less. But still, something you don't want around, so you will have to immediately go to your kidneys that will excrete it with your urine. And so you see, the liver and the kidneys have to do some work to catabolize proteins and allow their use for energy. Um, and on top of that, you will also increase your water loss because to flush out this extra urea, you will have to use water to excrete it with urine. And this is one of the two reasons why high-protein, low-carb diet will increase water loss. And the other is you deplete your glycogen stores, and glycogen coordinates a lot of water, so you will get rid of that as well, which is the reason that many weight loss diets are high-protein and low-carbohydrates. But remember that most of the weight you lose at first is actually water, which is not bad, not, or, but not good either. It's just not what you want to lose when you want to lose weight, because then you want to lose fat and not water. Coming up next on FSN 101, protein needs. So how much do we need of it? Remember we said uh, we also have to pay attention to protein quality. 
So whenever we talk about protein requirements, how many grams of protein we need, but don't forget, you also want to make sure you have all of your essential amino acids, so good enough protein quality. And also remember what we said before about uh, protein turnover. Our protein need is very high, but that doesn't mean we need to take all those protein from diet, because most of them we recycle. And that's what this red box says. Most amino acids from protein breakdown are recycled, so protein needs are lower than protein turnover. So we cannot use protein turnover to determine how much protein we need. Um, and the way we do it instead is we just want to match uh, the protein we'll lose with the protein we eat. So just the protein losses, we want to make sure that the amount of protein we lose or we catabolize, we bring back in so that we maintain nitrogen balance. And how do we lose protein? We excrete protein primarily with the urine. It's probably not the best sentence. We do not lose protein in the urine. If you're healthy, there's no protein at all in your urine. Um, it would actually signal that something's wrong. But you have the, pro the products of protein catabolism. So you will have your urea, you can usually just quantify nitrogen in your urine and from then calculate how many grams of protein you had to break down to have that amount of nitrogen in your urine. And then we also lose some uh, protein directly with our feces or our skin, our hair, nails, sperm. That's usually not a big amount, except for some circumstances like we have burns, excessive burns, so we'll lose a lot of skin. But there are some situations where we actually have increased protein requirements. Well, now first I have to tell you how much we need. So based on this calculation, um, which is not easy by the way, but uh, let's not go into that. Um, the protein requirements are generally low, but highly variable. And the recommended daily allowance for protein is 0.8 grams of protein per kilo of a healthy body weight per day. And by healthy, we mean, of course, if you're overweight or obese, you don't make the calculation based on your obese weight because then you would overestimate the protein you need. So you use the weight you would have if you were uh, normal weight. But for most people, the requirement is actually much lower. 50% uh, of the population actually needs 0.5 grams of protein per kilo per day. 25% of the population needs less than 0.5 as low as 0.2 grams per kilo per day. But the other 25 of the population needs more than 0.5, up to 0.8, which is the need for actually a very, very small part, about 2% of the population. But because protein are so important, and because we cannot really know when we do recommendation for the general population, we recommend eating the maximum possible amount. That's actually needed only by only a small part of the population, but so we are sure to catch everybody. Um, and if we express protein requirements like this, we also want to make sure that energy intake is adequate. So we want to make sure we have enough carbohydrates and lipids for energy, because otherwise we will have to divert part of that proteins for energy production, and then point A will not be enough uh, anymore. So this is for an efficient protein utilization. Uh, so we made some calculation for a body weight of average body weight of 70 kilograms times 0.8, you get 55, which is 55 grams of proteins per day, which is really not much. And again, keep in mind, this already exceeds the actual need of most of the population. An alternative rule of thumb uh, can be to express uh, you, um, protein is as percent of the energy and then you would want about 10 to 15 percent of your calories from proteins. 
And again, for an average 2,000 calories diet, 10% um, is 200, 15% is 300. Gram of protein, remember, carries four uh, kilocalories. So divided by four, you get 50 to 75 grams of protein per day. Um, which again is in, in the same range. The RDA is actually closer to 10% of energy from protein. And then as I was saying before, there are some situations, however, where you have increased protein needs. And these are, for example, growth. <laughs> now you need more proteins because you are building new tissues. So you need a little bit more. Infancy, adolescence, pregnancy. Or resistance exercise, weight training, bodybuilding, now you want to build some new muscles. So again, you're building new tissues, not just maintaining or repairing the one you have. And again, the requirement is not much. It will be about 10 extra grams of protein per day because you cannot really build more than that amount of muscle uh, per, per day and 6% of your muscle is protein. So it's really not much, but some. <coughs> Or, if you are recovering from illness or injury, or if you are ill or injured, because now you will have to repair tissues, so you will need more protein to do this maintenance work. While you are ill, you are probably in a so-called hypercatabolic state, so you are using more, and more proteins. And in particular, there are some situations where you need a real lot more, like burns to make all that tissues. Uh, trauma to make all the acute phase proteins. So here your requirement really can be higher, two grams per kilo per day, if not more. So more than twice, if not three times, the average requirement uh, for the population. Any questions so far? So the last three things we need to cover, not today, but you will have to put up with me on Friday as well, are protein calorie malnutrition, so when we do not have enough proteins and in general not even enough energy, and then high protein diet where we go above uh, the need of protein. What does that mean? Is that good? Is that bad? Uh, and then vegetarian and vegan diets. And I'll just introduce protein calorie malnutrition. Um, by saying that most of us in uh, North America and Europe and Western countries already have, you already eat, eat more protein than the requirement. So we are safe. And in general, even if we go on a particular weird diet or weight loss diet or unbalanced, vegan diet, we still will have enough proteins. Because remember, the need is low and actually lower than what's recommended. So it will not result in any deficiency. But it can happen short term. So for example, sometimes, you, you know, even if you do not eat for a day, you, you wake up, you're busy, you skip breakfast, and somehow you skip lunch, you don't eat until dinner, then uh, you will certainly deplete your glycogen store, and it will happen everything that we described before. So you will have to use fat for energy, but not, all, all, not, not only fat. You will need some anaerobic uh, source of energy. So you will have to use some protein. And then mostly you will have to use protein to maintain blood glucose. So even if you just do not eat for one day, you will start wasting some of your muscles, which is why you try to eat more frequently than just once a day. The real trouble then will be long-term protein deficiency, which, however, we will explore on Friday. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>